In this video, we'll see that when we operate two context-free languages using certain operations, the result is again a context-free language. We start showing that context-free languages are closed under the union operation. That is, if we have grammars for two languages, then there also exists a grammar for the language of the union. To get convinced of that, let G1 be a grammar that generates the language L1, and let G2 be a grammar that generates L2. With the laws of generality, we suppose that G1 and G2 do not have common variables, since otherwise we can rename the variables of one of them without modifying the generated language. To build a grammar generating the union of the language of G1 and G2, we define this operation, which we denote with the union symbol. However, it is important to remark that the operation is not the union of two sets, but an operation on two grammars that yields a new grammar as result. The resulting grammar has the variables of both grammars plus a new variable that will be the initial symbol. It has also the terminal symbols of both grammars and the rules of both grammars, plus a new rule that allows to generate from S either the language generated from S1 or the language generated from S2. In this way, from S, it is possible to generate L1 through S1 or L2 through S2. Hence, it is clear that we are generating the union of the initial languages. Let us remark that this is the union operation for grammars that gives another grammar a result, and this is the classic union operator for sets. However, context-free languages are not closed under intersection. For example, it is not difficult to find grammars for these two languages, but their intersection is not context-free, as we'll see further in this course. Context-free grammars are not closed under complementary neither. If they boot, since the intersection can be defined in terms of complementary and union, context-free grammars would be closed under intersection, which we already commented that is not true. Context-free grammars are closed by concatenation which means that if there is a grammar for two languages, then there exists also a grammar for their concatenation. To get convinced of that, we'll proceed in an analogous way as we did when dealing with the union operation. The difference is that now, from the initial symbol of the grammar, we'll generate the concatenation of S1 with S2. Hence, we can generate from S all the words that can be obtained as the concatenation of one word from L1 with one word from L2. Note that this is the concatenation operation for grammars that we just defined, and this is the concatenation operation for sets of words that we defined at the beginning of the course. In a similar way, we can get convinced that context-free languages are closed under the clean star operation, that is, if there is a grammar for a language, then there is also a grammar for its star of language. If we have a grammar for a language L, it is enough to add a new initial symbol S' prima and from it generate the concatenation of zero or more S' primas. In this way, we can generate the concatenation of zero or more words from L, obtaining L star. Context-free languages are also closed by the reverse operation. That is, if there is a grammar for a language, there is also a grammar for its reverse. The grammar for the reverse is easily obtained by keeping the original rules and reversing the right-hand sides. In this case, it might not be clear that this new grammar generates the reverse. Let's try to justify it. We'll argue something more general. From each variable, we generate the reverse of the language that was generated by that variable in the initial grammar. In fact, it suffices to check this inclusion. That's because if we apply twice the reverse operation on a grammar, we obtain the initial grammar again since we are simply reversing the right hand size of the rules twice. Hence, the opposite inclusion is implied by replacing here and here g by g to the r. We'll see that if a variable generates a word w with g, 
then it generates the reverse of W of G reverse. We'll show it by induction on the number of steps applied from X. Here we make explicit the first step and the following. Alpha 1 to alpha k are the symbols in the right hand side of a rule, which can be variables or terminals. From each alpha i, we have a subderivation into a subword wi with less rewriting steps. By induction hypothesis, from alpha i, one can generate the reverse of wi using g reverse. Hence, we also have this derivation using g reverse. Note that this right hand side is the reverse of the previous one. Note also that the reverse of the initial word is obtained concatenating in reverse order the reverses of each of these subwords. This concludes the proof. Context-free languages are also closed by morphism. That is, if there is a grammar for a language, then there is also a grammar for its image under any morphism. The new grammar is easily obtained by applying the morphism to the right-hand side of the rules of the initial grammar. Hence, the occurrences of variables are not affected by this modification. In other words, the definition of the morphism is extended to variables as the identity function. The argument to prove that this construction actually works is quite similar to the one for the reverse operation and hence is left as an exercise.